know, I always use sort of that hypothetical, you know, um, you know, you're, you're trying to sit down and develop a, a summit uh, between the U.S. president and the Chinese president. And, and, you know, the U.S. would make its list of issues, the Chinese would make its list of issues, and then you'd figure out what overlaps so you could actually get together and talk about. Um, and, and this is sort of, I think, what the, you know, the, the decision-making space today, you know, is, is very different. Um, you know, you, you and I don't use the Cold, Cold War analogy to today, though, you know, others do. Um, you know, they're, they're, the, key, the key difference, right, I, I would say, is there, there was uh, no ambiguity, um, you know, during Cold War versus today, you know, where in some places, you know, China, China's a partner, you know, on the question of, you know, in it, kind of the question of North Korea. So this goes back to sort of the, you know, like, what do you, what do you bias? So if you're primarily focused on uh, North Korea's nuclear program, China is an essential partner. Um, all right, full stop. Um, and, and then you're able to, as, as, you know, this administration, and, and then if we go back to, um, you know, during the Obama administration, um, you know, the number one concern at the time, I think, with China was really, you know, China buying U.S. debt, um, Chinese investment in the United States, uh, trade with China. And so we sort of um, didn't necessarily raise the questions of South China Sea um, and island reclamation. Um, we didn't really, you know, we, we had a bit of a, um, you know, a slowdown in intellectual property theft, uh, you know, that was developed between President Obama and Xi. Um, but you have to, right, you have to prioritize and you have to rank and saying, well, what is, what is the most important thing? And, and this is sort of the challenge for policymakers everywhere. Um, you know, the, the, you know, but I would say it, it's kind of, I, I think what this sort of the human security forces us to think about is what matters more. And, and then what's your timeline? Um, you know, uh, and, and so, because human security forces sort of a very people-centric view. So Americans should care what happens to freedoms in Hong Kong or uh, the Uyghurs, um, you know, or, um, you know, even uh, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and, um, and so that, you know, that should matter. Um, but the current international system, which the U.S. largely benefits from, um, that might be changing. So, so maybe this is sort of that window is uh, that, you know, human security says it, it's about, right, it's it sort of, in my mind, it sort of shifts, like, what, what lens are you looking at it, things? Are you looking at problems through a sovereignty lens? Um, or are you looking at problems through sort of a human lens? And while it's tempting to see, you know, the pitfalls of globalization, you know, today, and countries are, are, are reacting. And so, you know, j just like the U.S. has been trying to reshore manufacturing in the United States, even before COVID-19, um, China has a made in 2025 uh, program that they want to create really domestic uh, IT information technology companies in China, because they're skeptical. So, and, you know, countries will always sort of favor, right, they're, they're, you want the benefits of globalization without the costs. COVID-19 sort of puts all that in stark contrast, because if really people movement is, you know, effectively stopped, um, and there is an effort to revive domestic industry, uh, that'll probably be tempting. Um, but, you, you know, I'd highlight, um, you know, the, you know, historically, again, the, the 1918 um, influenza, that moved around the world without air travel. Um, and so maybe it would just be a little slower. Um, or you look at a case of climate change. Borders do not matter with climate change. So it sort of forces that, I think, that cooperation. Mm -hmm.